Welcome to Chris Waddell Living It, where I talk with experts in the experience of being human. Today, we're in for a total treat. Good friend Kate Geegan is joining us. Kate said that she is a sustainable diet expert. Now, I want you to define that, but I'm going to give you give a few of the other bullet points before I do that. She's a co-founder of Food and Planet, winner of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Leadership at Excellence Award, Outstanding Nutritional Entrepreneur, Top 10 Dietitians Making a Difference. So she is, she is huge in the diet world, huge in the environmental world, but what is a sustainable diet expert, Kate? <laughs> well, Chris, it's such a pleasure to be here. Honestly, we go way back and um, we've had some of the great conversations of my life. So thank you for having Yay. me here and for sharing your time with me. It's really such a privilege and a pleasure. Um, yeah, so sustainable diet expert. Um, you know, simply put, this is all quite well known and clear now, but um, when I was first getting started in this space, I'd been a dietitian, registered dietitian for about 10 years, and it was 2007, and I was actually living in Park City, and the mayors of the Intermountain West were getting together for something called Save Our Snow, and it was really looking at what are we going to do in the Intermountain West if the climate models are right, that below 10,000 feet, we won't have snowpack in the winter, starting in around 2030, depending on which model you're using. And as someone who's a lifelong skier and outdoor enthusiast, and you and I have shared a lot of time together in Park City, I kind of started Googling, basically, does diet have any impact? And this was 2007. And the bottom line is, back then I said, oh, crap. I don't know if on this podcast I got to keep it clean or not. So I said something a little stronger than oh crap, but the American diet is the SUV of eating styles. And we know that it's driving chronic inflammation, chronic disease, depression, anxiety, um, and really medicating people. This idea of like a medicalized life is feeling very normal. And on top of that, so that had been the space I had been working in and playing in to try to really drive wellness and well-being as a, as a foundational model. And then I, you layer on this idea of, hey, everyone is talking about climate change and these impending crises, um, but no one's talking about food and the intersection of that. This was 2007. So really the opportunity that I saw to, um, be a force multiplier. Suddenly food became a force multiplier, not just for the kind of life you want to live, but the kind of world we want to live in and leave for our children and future generations to come. Because the food system is right up there with what you drive, with what your carbon footprint is when you fly. Um, so there was such opportunity to solve on multiple fronts some of the biggest challenges that people face. And, and, and it's stuff that we don't think about though, right? I mean, we think about our food, but we don't think about how our food has to get to us and the process and the processing and the packaging and all of those things. I mean, and this for you ended up manifesting itself in a book, right? Yeah, so I was really fortunate. Um, I think the publishing world has obviously changed a lot since then, but um, we were living in Park City and I had a six month old and a one and a half year old. And I said to my husband, there's gonna be a huge transformation in how we think about healthy food and healthy food systems. And I have this idea for a book and I really wanna be the one to contribute and try to write it and try to get it published because I think I could be a helpful voice and I feel just very called to expanding my nutrition and diet expertise into this space and seeing how I can be of service. And being on the cutting edge of it because people weren't... Yes, I knew if I didn't write the book proposal right then, it had to be about a new idea and a new insight or I wouldn't get the book deal because who was I? I was just a dietitian, you know, doing my thing in Park City. And even, 
even back then, the publishing has changed so much now, but even back then, of course, you had to go in with a platform and an idea of, so um, I wrote the proposal and we shopped it around and I had three book, uh, three publishing companies that wanted to bid on it. And I went with Rodale just because Rodale, you know, they're the grandfather of the organic movement in the United States. And I felt like they would really support the vision and the work. What did you tell them? Like when you were, when you were, when you were pitching this, what was, what was your pitch? What is, wh how did you say to them, this is what's going to be transformational. This is why you need to publish this. I said, we need to move from low carb to low carbon. <laughs> and that perked their ears up to say, oh, tell me more. Why? Like that's new. We haven't heard anyone talking about that. And I said, you know, the American diet is the SUV of eating styles. And we know it's this driver of disease, but here is a completely new entry point for consumers to be thinking about. And we really framed it in a positive, empowering way. It wasn't to guilt people and shame people. It was to awaken people of, to these connections. And, you know, they were seeing it all across other media and other parts of their life but we were really one of the first. It turned out there were several books that came out that year about this concept. But um, you know that was the beginning of the conversation. And I know it was the beginning, Chris, because I can tell you in my, my other dietitian work, I was uh, asked to speak at my health professional conference. And at that time, truly the mainstream was like, oh, that's a nice to have. They're there. That's interesting if people have the time and the privilege and the money, but our consumers are about taste, price, value. And if you think of how dramatically that has evolved, right, when you've got all these food companies now, frankly, clamoring to show how they're part of the solution and all of this has really converged on the plate. Um, it's just, this shift has been tremendous in 10 years of where the movement has come. And the solution really is the solution of the climate change with also with the health, right? With, with people's personal health and being responsible for it. And in your book, you talk about how it really, a lot of this momentum started back in World War II, right? Came out of post-World War II. Is it a big ship? I mean, is, is our, 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 our tendencies a big ship? Is it hard to go and change from processed food to I'm going to grab this and go to going to more whole foods and those kinds of things? You know, it's such a great question. I, I, my answer would be a combination of our human biology, the current choice architecture that the modern food system has driven because they are based on a profit model, not a wellness model. And the story that we have been told as an American culture, we didn't have Madison Avenue shaped America's eating habits, like they shaped a lot of other things. And um, I, I bought a one way ticket to Italy after college. Uh, it taught me a tremendous amount about cultural food pathways, food heritage, things that are passed down from generation, um, living in uh, closer to the seasons and cycles of nature. And I'm not trying to romanticize it, um, but I had grown up in a working class family outside of Boston and both my parents worked and my mom didn't cook. So this was tremendously new to me. And I imagine for many people who grew up like I did, um, you don't have that opportunity. Everything I ate growing up was out of a bag, a box, a pouch or a can. And it was done for convenience, it was done for price. I never actually really had true mashed potatoes until like college because my mom bought those like potato flakes that you just added margarine because margarine was like better for you than butter back then right. and boiling water for your potatoes. So, you know, I was a, a tang kid. The future of food was innovation. And um, it's, it's interesting now. And many of, many of those innovations, and by the way, the modern industrial ag food system came out of World War II with good intentions at the time, right? It was to stabilize a food supply, make it affordable for Americans, and um, keep prices, 
predictable for the supply market. Um, and unfortunately, that delivered, the efficiencies delivered on the economics, but not to human health. And so that's really the shift. And now layer on top of that, the resource base that is used and the upstream and the downstream impacts that we're, try we're now connecting the dots, right? Like um, what we buy at the grocery store, that wrapped chicken breast or that wrapped fish or that can of beans is one point in the continuum of that food. And how did you get here? Because you talk about growing up as a Tang kid, but I know you as a lover <laughs> of food. I know you as a lover of cooking. And did that happen on your own? How did you, how did you deviate from the family and from the momentum of the country to be a lover of food and a lover of cooking? I love that, Chris. Thanks. A good question. And I feel like we should let the audience in on a little secret between us, which is that when I first moved to Park City and we were looking for a house, I was bribing you with meals <laughs> so we could use your kitchen and continue to stay with you. So I, I have shamelessly exploited my love of food. Um, <laughs> hey, I was a happy participant in that. It really began with that moving to Italy. So that was 1996, and now this was before the EU, post college. But in college, you were still you still had your own your own food. You were buying your own food. You weren't going to the dining hall. Didn't some of this happen beforehand? You know, I think it it did, and I attribute some of that to the exposure I got at college. My boyfriend's family was very into these kinds of things, picking up. A loaf of good bread from the local bakery. That was nothing I'd been exposed to. I didn't know great bread grew mold. <laughs> you mean you have to slice your own bread? What What is up with this yeah. stuff? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, different experiences that obviously awakened something in me, but I, I would say a lot in college was my, my boyfriend's family who was very into, they had a garden, they cooked at home. And I, I just, at the time I would have said, oh, I was um, I just happened into it, but I think it awakened something in me that I then wanted to go explore and was really feeling called like, wow, this is a path that's really interesting, a thread that I want to follow. Because you, you work in nutrition now, nutrition and environment, but you weren't, you weren't studying that, were you in college? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> I was a theology major. I was a religion major. You know, my parents sent me to college with the whole like study what you love and then of course the day I graduate they're like so what are you going to do with that religion degree but it's actually I mean I, I think it's a tremendous I'm so grateful every day that I had it because religion and theology is a mix of philosophy and history and peoples and um, especially as the world has sort of complexified and become seemingly smaller it's really been like a wonderful bedrock to grant my thinking and what's probably no irony is my thesis was actually on the rio de janeiro summit was 1992 which was one of the first times the global community came together to mobilize around this idea of this shared resource of the atmosphere these shared planetary resources and how might we move forward and my thesis actually looked at what are elements of Gaia and the religious archetype of Gaia that can help us reimagine our relationship to the natural world rather than one of being external from and separate from and having dominion over uh, and this sort of divine right to anything that's on earth what if we are part of nature and we are humble parts of nature how would that impact so actually when my book came out i sent a copy chris to my thesis advisor at college <laughs> to say hey it all kind of came together well it really did because you're you're asking questions of, of essence in so many ways i mean the foundational questions in religion and theology 
and I'd imagine in your in your thesis as well. But that's what you're trying to do with regard to food and the environment too, right? That we take so much for granted. We take so much of what we see is what is, as opposed to can we break it down into, into its essential bits, which are its healthful bits and the things that we need. And so it, to me, it sounds like a logical progression to a certain extent coming from, coming from theology into nutrition. When did, the, when did the nutrition stuff start? Did that start before you went to Italy? Because we've got to get to Italy. Because, I mean, we, we have to go to Italy, right? I mean, we have to go to Italy. Yeah, we have to go to Italy. Um, yes, you know, I, after college, wanted to go drive west, live in a ski town, wasn't really sure of a plan for a year. Um, somehow in my mind, I'd settled on this idea of, I want to just go explore and travel and wander. Um, and I'd love to go live in a ski town for a year. Um, and my parents said, well, as long as you can support yourself, great. And, but after a year, you need to kind of have a plan. And so I came out to Sun Valley, Idaho, totally by chance, just in a car with friends, someone had a it was, in hindsight, it's an extremely privileged story in hindsight. My husband and I talk about this a lot. He's like, oh, I went right into my job two weeks out of college because I had student loans to pay. So it must have been nice. So I fully recognize now, like it was a very opportune gift that my parents had given me that college had been paid for. Um, and so I came to Sun Valley. I was skiing, waitressing recording commercials as a DJ for the local radio station. I was hustling. I was hustling to make it all work. Well, you do hustle and though. You're a good hustler. I have always, I enjoy engaging and, and working and yeah, I'm a hustler. Um, anyway, I was in a bookstore one day and it dawned on me in my year that I'd been out, every book I've checked out of the library, every time I walked into the bookstore, I gravitated toward the food, the nutrition, the culinary section of these library or bookstore. Hmm. And I just remember sitting there having an aha moment, like, that's really interesting. Like, I'm feeling really drawn to this. Now, are these like cookbooks or are they like books about the history of food or what kind All of- All of the above. I was taking, I was learning to bake bread. So I was taking out books on how to make bread and exploring different, I was too poor to buy cookbooks. So I was just renting cookbooks out of the library or going and kind of like perusing the bookstore, which now in COVID sounds like a disaster. But back then, you know, it was kind of what, the ski bums could do you like poke around in the back and anyway um and it just dawned on me and i also knew i had done my junior year of college abroad because i was an italian minor and that had just really opened my eyes and i knew in my heart i also want to go back to italy because if i don't go now i'll be too scared to go later or i'll feel like life has already moved Forward. Right. You have responsibilities. Where did you go for your junior year abroad? Which city did you go to? So I went to Florence. Okay. And again, this was before the EU. This was, I still remember my parents' calling card number because once a month I would make a call from my host family's phone to talk to my parents for about 15 minutes because it was like $500 a minute or whatever it was back then to call. There was no internet, or there was, but we didn't know about it then. Um, and so it just really awakened in me this idea of go travel, go do something, go learn about food, and you'll know when it's time to come home. And again, if you can hustle, you'll, you'll survive. You're a well-functioning human being, go, go do it. And, and most importantly, Chris, my parents psychologically, felt like, oh, okay, she's no longer just ski bumming. She's moving on to something of value. So like, it was a win-win. I was still kind of duping the parents. <laughs> you, well, apparently you're, you're good on the sales side. You're leaving the ski oh. bomb side. And, well, now I need to go to Italy. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That sounds like a wonderful right. idea. I'm like, I've saved up money. Oh, and this is, this is actually, and this is a story 
people marvel at when I tell them, but it is true and you can probably relate from our generation. Speaking of the library experience, I got a book out of the library here in Sun Valley, Cooking Schools in Italy, and I wrote 30 letters to 30 cooking schools in Italy. Handwritten asking, letters. Saying, all I have is, I speak Italian. I'm fluent in Italian and I'm willing to hustle. Do you have a spot for me? And I got three letters back. One was a no, one was a maybe, and one was a yes. <laughs> so I bought a one-way ticket just with this letter. And she said, and we joke about it because I'm still very friendly with the cooking school founder. Her, her name is, and we should put this in the show notes, she's amazing. And she's still in Tuscany. Um, and she's Judy Witz, and her company is Divina Cucina, Divine Kitchen. And we still joke because what she technically wrote back was, well, I don't know you from a hole in the wall, so I'd have to meet you first. But if you get yourself here and we hit it off, I am actually looking for an assistant who, can, who has lived and is comfortable moving about Italy, but actually is American because she was doing a lot of the YPO and the National Geographic groups and the student teaching culinary to students, American universities. So she needed someone who could play in both worlds. And kind of be a translator. Now, did you think that you were gonna go into being a dietitian or did you think you were going to be a chef? Or what did you think? I think at that time I was very open to being a chef. I thought I'll work at a cooking school, I will hone, some experience. I will learn some wisdom, what will trans, transmute ultimately into wisdom around food. Um, but then being there, and, and by the way, also having worked in catering quite a bit, as you know, you came and saw me at the Boston Symphony one summer. Right. I, I just realized at, at that point, I, I thought, I, I don't know what my entry point is to the food. Um, I thought it might be through cooking in the kitchen. And what I realized over that year, little over a year that I was there, Chris, was food is my passion. I love when people come to my house and cook and I can connect with them through food and share it with my family, but it doesn't have to be my profession in that way. I'm a little more intellectual. I, I found myself, um, what I mean by that is I found myself gravitating more towards the intellectual side of food. And that's where I was like, I wanna do a deeper dive there. The science behind the health of the Italian and Mediterranean diet and the wisdom of eating seasonally and locally. And so all of these were puzzle pieces that have gradually come together over the past decades. But in hindsight, of course, for all of us, you can kind of re-knit together some of your experiences and how each one has informed the next. What did you see in the food in Italy? You've touched on a little bit of it, but what was so different than you growing up as a Tang kid? Oh my gosh. Um, when you step into the central market in Florence, it smells like live food, life. The first floor is all the butchers, the fish, the chicken, the meat. There are grates in the floor. It's a cement floor with grates because they're hosing down constantly. It's a much more real version. My Tang childhood was what many people, um, what most people experience, a very sanitized experience with food, right? Like you go into the supermarket and in most places it doesn't smell. They've gotten a little better now, right? Like it started maybe with oh baked bread and have rotisserie chicken, and but like you don't smell the cheeses and the raw fish, and I don't mean it in a bad way. These were all just like background aromas to this teeming place of where food was being sold, and so that was that was big. Even just the cuts of meat when you looked at the butcher case, the chicken case. Um, much more primal, much more deeply connected to the animal experience. We've been really sophisticated in the U.S. with that. Um, you know, the, the zeitgeist might be the chicken nugget, right? Something that is so hyper-processed and orchestrated to be convenient, portable, tasty, 
um, fit every food service requirement. And then you go there and it's body parts in the case. So much more primal and having that connection. Sounds um, like it's all senses, really. I mean, oh, it's the, huge it's the sight, senses. smell, touch, everything, yeah. right? And because all the produce was so fresh and seasonal, it smelled like the strawberries would just ooze fragrance. And it was the first time supermarkets have gotten a lot more sophisticated in the US since the 90s, but like seeing this, you know, 50 shades of kale all at once, I had never seen that in mushrooms, like mushrooms and eggplants. I'd never really interacted with mushrooms or eggplants before going to Italy. So on so many levels, Chris, and then you would go, and this was the other, the expertise and the knowledge. So you'd go to the cheese guy and he would say, oh, you have to try this pecorino because this is the week that the purple flowers are blooming in Tuscany and the sheep eat them and see this color of this pecorino, see how it's different from last batch of pecorino, that's the, the pigments and it will have a different aroma and the floralness of the flower will come through. And now 20 years later, we have peer reviewed research showing there's a nutritional component difference when animals graze differently, that milk translates into a different nutritional picture and impact on our body. So so I'd imagine th this is where you really fall in love with food, where you understand food and that the, the micro differences make a huge difference in what you're producing. The other big shift going to Italy, really ex being exposed to the first time to what I would say was just high quality foods. And Tuscany is very simple. It's historically peasant food. There's not even salt in Tuscan bread because they were too poor. There's a lot of organ meat in Tuscan cuisine because the rich were eating the, you know, the loins and the, the rumps and the, the local people were eating the brains and the guts. So, um, it, but it is about this real respect of the food, nature, human connection. And I just, I saw that respect, whether it was the butcher or the cheese case or the vegetable vendor and how proud they were. Um, and there was such honor and dignity in the food system that as we reflect on where we are today, I think that's a huge opportunity in this country to reimagine our food system workers, our food system contributors, people who are building, rebuilding the land and rebuilding a resilient, sustainable, sustainable, inclusive food system. I mean, I really saw that there. And you're taking that back to the pride that these people have in their individual food that they're producing. I would say the way Americans like own, so to speak, this idea of freedom, right? Like Americans have a very, we might not all agree, but we, freedom is something Americans know and everyone has an opinion on. That's how Italians feel about food. So that's the best kind of um, analogy I think I could give you. <laughs> Did you feel like you'd seen something that you needed to bring back to the US? Is this what led you to going to nutrition? Because I'm assuming that then you studied nutrition after Italy. Do I have the timeline correct? Yes, yes, you do. Um, yeah, truly, Chris, um, after about a year, and I, I, I'd come to this realization, um, I also, for what it's worth, you know, was sort of like, I guess I'm not going to marry an Italian and live here forever. <laughs> the fairy tale. Um, the fairy tale. Um, and was like, okay, I think I'm going to go do that intellectual piece. So I am not kidding. I landed on a Sunday. And on Monday, I was standing in line at Simmons College registering for prereqs because the downside of being a theology major, as much as that was really glorious at the time, when I then realized I wanted to be a dietitian or at that, just go into nutrition, I had to take a couple classes <laughs> that I had missed in college. But it was immediate. Like I landed and I was like, okay, this is my next step. I'm going into food. And that's when I started. I did 
biology, chemistry during the day. And then at night I worked at the Boston Symphony catering to help pay the bills. Pay the bills. Did you know where you wanted to go? Did you know what you wanted, what, what it was going to look like when you, when you, after you finished your studies and started working? You know, at first I, I thought I'm going to get a master's in nutrition because I was still in that liberal college mindset, a liberal arts college. So I'm like, I'll get a master's in nutrition and then I shall know nutrition. So I started down that path. And what I ended up realizing is to actually engage with people and legally dole out nutrition advice, um, it's very helpful to be a registered dietitian and have licensed credentials um, and be in the medical community versus sort of the intellectual policy community. And again, this was just my journey. There's many, many people I've met since who have like an MPH and, you know, they're, they're approaching it. There's so many ways to approach it. But for me, I realized I kind of wanted that medical grounding. So I added one year to become a registered dietitian and do an internship and um, actually out in Idaho where I saw we worked on everything from native people's reservations doing with the Shoshone Blackfoot Indian tribes to delivering meals on wheels to shut in seniors to doing government programs to asking people if they want french fries with that burger. <laughs> I saw it all. Well, how did that, how did those kinds of things, I mean, so you've got, you've got your, your college boyfriend's family uh, with a, with a garden, then you have, then you have Italy, then you have Meals on Wheels, you have, you have going to some of the reservations, you have, you have burgers and fries. How did all that inform and shape the direction that you wanted? Because it's always a personal journey too, isn't it? That's such a good question. So dietetics is typically a very female, it still is, it's 97% female. And it actually evolved out of World War II, as you said. Um, it, the military actually is who started it because so many um, men were failing the draft. So the school, many people don't know this, but the school lunch program was implemented during the draft of World War II because there was such malnutrition um, that we did not have uh, enough people passing the draft. Um, the, the basic physical requirements, healthy enough to, to qualify. So that the federal government stepped in and ironically now, not ironically, but ironically, um, it is military generals, if anyone is watching is interested, who have retired military generals, several of them have come together and recently put a report out called To Fight, Too Fat, To Fight. And it is how the school lunch program has been co-opted by commodities. And actually we're again at a point where the number one reason people who try to enlist are turned away is because they are overweight or obese. So that we are not, our policies of how we nourish our children and the next generation. Um, I like to say it can make a conservative argument because often I feel like these issues get promoted as or um, pinned as by people who maybe won't be on board as being like really liberal or really progressive. And one thing that I think, Chris, is so important especially in food where we all are stakeholders, is how do we find the entry points for, that resonate with the target audience? Everyone has their own experience with food. This has been so fun to be unpacking like Kate Geegan's unique experience, but the truth is everyone listening and watching, you have your own experiences with food, these touchstones, these belief systems, um, you know, that, how, if we're asking people to make changes, we're asking people to shift, how do you do it in a way that is respectful of that, that honors that, but find some entry points to create meaning and value for those people, uh, for anybody. You, you talk about this in your book, because part of it is, how do you help people help their children? 
mm-hmm. as well. It sounds like one of the, that's one of the big entry points. And it's fun, like doing what I do with my foundation, where we do where we do school presentations. I feel like the greatest gift you can give some, give a community is doing something for their children. Right. Amen. And, and it's, Yes. Similar kind of deal for you, right? That's one of the entry points, even though you don't have a common experience necessarily, mm-hmm. because it's easy to feel high, high brow, heavy handed with regard right. to nutrition, right? You should be doing this differently. Well, I like to do this. How, how, how do you, I mean, I imagine for you helping to create that shift is, is one, something that's intriguing, but two, also something that is integral in the success 100%. of someone moving forward because it has to be a, a fairly, fairly big shift right yeah exactly and just to tie it back to what we you had asked me a question earlier and i kind of went in another direction but my focus has always been on wellness so dietetics if it started about diseases of deficiency and then it moved to chronic disease treatment right um, I knew I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be further up the pipeline and get people excited about the power of food to create the life they want, right? And um, so how you do that, Chris, my being in wellness, I've had experiences across the whole ecosystem. And the truth is what resonates with people is really different. So you have to find your entry points, your why, your big why. So, um, you know, Tony Robbins would say people are driven by two pr- primary emotions. They're either moving away from fear or towards like, he uses the word like greed, like, but it's towards like desire. So there's desire, you wanna move to something. Think about the bride who has six months to fit into the wedding dress of her dreams. Like she's moving towards that. Think about, um, I had a client once who was obese and he had been on an airplane where the seatbelt did not fit him. And they had to ask him to move seats up to first class. He was, there was shame, there was humiliation, and there was this deep, like, I'm never gonna put myself in that situation again and what do I need to do? So those are two kind of extreme examples, but we all throughout the day um, move in those two directions, at, at least while we have willpower. We, as decisions go on throughout the day, our willpower erodes and it gets a heck of a lot harder. But um, so you have to find those entry points. So when I worked with military wounded warriors, my brother served in, uh, he was a captain in the Marines. He's deployed to Iraq, as you know. It's all about, rapid recovery and enhancing resilience. So if I talk to a Marine about his risk of heart disease or her risk of dementia 10 or 15 years from now, their eyes are gonna glaze over. They need what I call right now relevance to feel like it's going to matter. So um, with, with military, it's often about quicker recovery so you are ready and also Um, supporting your, you know, stress response. So it's optimized to cycle through it, your rest recovery, you know, parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. Because at the end of the day, there's no alchemy. What you put in, you get out. There's no like morphing of junk food into great human biology, supporting neurotransmitters and hormones, which is very much explains why we have these skyrocketing epidemics that we do of things like depression and anxiety and chronic inflammation because we're not putting in the right building blocks. But that's kind of the myth of youth in some ways, right? That like as a young as a younger person, you can go and eat whatever you want to eat and then you can go out and ski all day or you can go out and go for a bike ride or you can go out and do whatever and it really doesn't amount to too much, but there's more of a cumulative effect and those of us who are getting a little bit older want to maintain our lifestyle, our active lifestyle, and looking, you know, looking 10 years, 15 years down the line and saying, no, that's the quality of life. That to me is living fully, is being able to do the stuff that I want to do. But in order to do that, I need to make some quality decisions in order to be able to do what 
I want to do. So you're talking about a, a variety of different groups. And for you, I think you're similar to me in the sense of wanting to live full, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to, this is, no, I'm not going to age. I'm going to continue to be at 50, the same person that I was at 30 mm -hmm. and, and be able to play with my kids and possibly, you know, grandkids and these kinds of things. I mean, not that, not that you're pushing grandkids right now, but, <laughs> but in time to be able to do that. So how do you, how do you find, I mean, it sounds like with the military, you find that, you know, what they need in terms of rapid response, but I'd imagine there are a lot of nuts out there that you have to crack, you know, that you have to crack that nut to figure out what's it, what's going to be the thing. Because I remember reading something and, and it was talking about heart disease, people who'd had, who'd had open heart surgery and like nine out of 10 of them did not change the lifestyle that led them to having heart surgery. So you'd think that that is, that is a gigantic light bulb, right? That it's like, okay, I should, I should change this. I've, I've seen the possibility and I should change it. How do you, how are you able to do it? Because changing diet is hard. Even just going to the supermarket and thinking it, it's active thought, like it's exhausting to go to the supermarket and buy different things, isn't it? How, how do you bring that strategy to each interaction? Well, I think there's probably a lot to unpack there, but <laughs> one thing is mindset is everything. Like you, your mindset of how you approach, is this a problem? Is this an opportunity? Is this something I'm going to solve by Friday? What are my motivations for doing it? Right. Um, getting really clear on your why can help be a, a powerful first step to set yourself up for success. And most people are actually surprised that the very first thing you look at when you're trying to change your diet actually isn't food, it's your sleep. We have such sleep deprivation in this country. If you are not getting at least seven hours of quality sleep a night, which the vast majority of us don't, your hunger and satiety hormones are off. Your metabolic signaling is off about glucose and um, you know, how your pancreas is signaling. So you can have all the best intentions, but if you're sleep deprived, your biology is going to be working against you. So there's one great, like easy entry point. And we as a society are, are averaging like an hour less of sleep than a generation before, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we've undervalued sleep for ages and there's now so many wellness gurus, right? Talking about sleep as if the benefits of sleep were in a pill, <laughs> the government would wanna be, you know, vaccinating everyone with it right now because it's so profound, the restorative and resetting to your point, Chris, about longevity. Um, because for me, it's not just lifespan, it's health span. How long are you living disease-free and at your highest? And the current, if we add, you know, PowerPoint slides right now, the current thinking, or sorry, excuse me, the current American experience is like almost a bell curve, right? Like a kind of, your peak is your 30s, and then it kind of just descends and descends. People gain weight, people gain autoimmune disease or chronic inflammatory diseases. We have this cascade of medication that people go on. We've normalized all of this, right? To your point about the doctor, I know from direct family experience as well as you know hundreds and hundreds of clients, oftentimes, and it's a lot of MDs, cardiologists, they might not have time or they might not know what your stage of readiness is. And so they'll say, oh, you can try diet and exercise, but like, here's a statin and here's a blood thinner. So, Anyway, first step is mindset. Second step I would say is find entry points that feel exciting and really settle on your why. So another example, when I worked with CEOs around the state of Massachusetts, it was about a competitive advantage. We talked about lunch and how that was their most important meal of the day and that if done right, it would be a competitive advantage in the afternoon, in meetings, in you know, whatever work they were doing. And then suddenly they're like, ooh, okay, 
how does it improve my performance in the next couple hours? Which it's, it's all back to motivation. And for a lot of people, I would imagine it's also about the incremental finding ways to be successful. Yes. Each day, because if you're not successful, then you're like, okay, I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I'm going to be done. Totally. And that's such a good point, Chris. In America, we're so black and white. You're either on or you're off the diet. You're either perfect and like on this cleanse or something, or, you know, you, you're eating the, the Uber Eats greasy delivery bag because you're stress eating from COVID. I always, you know, if you just, it's kind of like finance. Like if 80% of the time you're making the right decisions, you actually have some wiggle room of calories and behaviors. I mean, I'll be honest, I love potato chips. I eat potato chips every single night. And I'm not even kidding you. You know, like I have my small little bowl, my glass of wine. I love potato chips. In Italy, all the bars had them. And it's like, it'll, um, potato chips and olives, as you know, because you've been to my house. I used to, <laughs> I always have olives. But, you know, for the most part, the day, everything's really, I get all the good stuff in and get the right stuff. So there's room for some not ultra healthy choices and that's okay. So lose the black and white thinking and just aim for progress, aim for 80, 20. And, and really for a lot of people, I learned this on the Dr. Oz show, focusing on what you need to add first rather than what you need to take away helps naturally work with your psychology to make it feel a lot easier. And avoid the guilt, right? The guilt is our downfall in so much of food. Well, I, now I'm a failure, so it really doesn't matter. So I'm, I'm going to have four more pints of ice cream or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How did, how did the environmental component come into, into the health component? Because in a lot of ways, you're, you're sort of cracking the same nut, aren't you, in the, in the environmental side? Yeah, so, so like I said, the, the aha moment was this connection that these two things were related. And then when you start digging in, it's extraordinary, the overlaps of what works for human resilience and planetary resilience. Everything from the ratio of foods in your diet. So the evidence I'd invite people to look at would be National Geographic Blue Zones. These are areas in the world where National Geographic and Dan Buettner, who did this work, incredible, they worked in reverse. So rather than saying like keto diet, paleo diet, high carb, low carb, these things people have been fighting about in the 25 years I've been a dietitian, we kind of cycle through. Um, they worked in reverse and they mapped the planet and said, where are people living the longest and the most disease-free lives? And what do they have in common? Where are these concentrations? So they identified five regions that have more centenarians than anywhere in the world. Average life expectancies are in the 90s. These are medical free lives for the most part, not on all these chronic medications. And these are people who die, um, instead of the bell curve, it's off a cliff. Like they're thriving, they're living it at a very high level right until the end. They die during sleep, and they die during sex. That's the top two ways. As I've heard Dan Buettner say, um, that people in these regions die. Now, I don't know about you, but that's how I'd love to go, one of those two ways. <laughs> well, that's what I, I was assuming there was a segue into it, that if you had your choice, okay, either, either sleep or sex is a good way to go. <laughs> I might add skiing to the list, like I've got one more S, but I'm good. <laughs> it, it is funny that you say that because I've had to prop up my laptop to to get my camera into into the correct place and blue zones kitchen is actually one of the books mm. that and and this is not just because of you this I just happens it. to be one of the books and i've been cooking out of it which is great and it's a one of the things that's so easy is that most of the things are relatively quick mm -hmm. and easy to make they also are like i mean they talk about uh, talk about like 40 ingredients or whatever, like the 40 ingredients that, that are cycled through where we think, oh, well, we need so much variety. And it's like, no, they're, they're creating a variety of different things mm -hmm. from, from the, and, and you also talk about in your book, which is part of what they're, like, I, I had no idea, th this, is, this is the ignorance, right? I had no idea, like, 
really where salt came from. Mm-hmm. I mean, salt for me comes out of a shaker. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas you see people actually taking the salt out of this out of the sea and going through a process and creating their salt, that then they are this is really truly sea salt. It's coming out of the sea and going going into your food. You talk about being a locavore. And, and that to me is part of the blue zones, right? The idea of you, you are cooking, cooking what's there. What can you expand upon what it means to be a locavore and also what the benefits are for all of us and how the benefits might apply to the environment as well? Yeah. So, you know, on several levels, the idea of having some of your calories, the extent that you are able, because you know, depending where you live and depending what your access is and where you get your food from, um, supporting a local and regional food system is vital on so many levels when we talk about health. So in the immediacy, one great thing of having some local and seasonal foods in your diet is it's gonna naturally force you to migrate through different foods. So even think of your farmer's market or a lot of grocery stores now, like our local grocery store here, they'll bring in local farm produce throughout the year. And if you just even do that, you're gonna start maybe with like asparagus in spring and maybe peaches and apricots, and then you're gonna rotate through in the summer. You'll naturally have food diversity in your diet, which means you'll be exposed to a variety of nature's benefits. Different colors in nature are, it's like nature's pharmacy teeming with different benefits. These phytonutrients that do everything from protect your brain to quiet um, cells from replicating cancer cells or triggering early cell death to turning on your right genes and calming genes we want to keep quiet. So, And also being, being ripe on the vine as well, right? Yes. Yeah, so one is you're de- rotating through foods. The second is you're shortening transit time. Right. So chefs love that. I, and I, I know this because I've asked hundreds of chefs over the years, local or organic. And they will say ideally both, but if not both, then local trumps organic because of the flavor. Flavor is a huge indicator of what is the enzymatic vitality. What is the vibrancy of that food? We know the minute we harvest, um, vitamins start to degrade, uh, enzymes start to degrade, phytonutrients start to degrade, but fresh local seasonal food can help you optimize your exposure to all that. Again, because it's this marathon. If we're talking about health span and lifespan, this is like daily stuff. And and you said also closer, less, less distance to drive from the farm to the market or to the restaurant, which is helping the environment as well. Helping the environment and, you know, doing your best to, if there is a CSA, supporting local farmers, because that's also going to be a local regional carbon sink, helping to ensure that land and food, look in COVID right now, I will say, just to share a quick COVID story, I was reading everything that was happening in the news around supply chains collapsing and grocery stores being bare in some of these parts of the country. And it made me, we're so tied into a local and regional food system that I didn't see any gap because my meat is from this local guy. Um, I'm very fortunate that we have a garden. So this summer that helped, but the local farmers were still able to show up with their CSAs. Um, We have a local dairy. There's a lot of legumes and lentils being grown in Idaho. So we were a little more resilient. And that is a word we're going to see both for human biology, for um, society, right? Like how do we boost resilience? COVID has laid bare how brittle and how, how fragile so much of this prosperity is in reality because there's no resilience in the system. You're talking about this on the personal level, right? That we we make our choices. We make our choices to support local farmers. We're getting better food. We're getting tastier food because it has all of the nutrients in it. 
But how do, how do we affect that greater change? Is it going to be from the individuals or, or is there another way to affect that greater change? Oh, such a great question. And again, I think really depends on who you are and where you are and what you aspire to um, achieve. Because the reality is I'm sharing a very like unique experience from me, but we all have them. And I was on a, a webcast last week with this amazing couple um, for, who created, they're two dietitians who created the Eat Well Exchange in Texas. And they're working with um, sort of communities of color who might not have access. There's a lot of food deserts and don't have access to a lot of the things I've described because I live in rural Idaho. And they talked about how their magic with the kids and the next generation is doing community gardens and showing them how to include and incorporate more plants at every meal and snack. Because these are bedrock skills that they'll have forever once they learn how to do it, right? It's not going to be something that could be taken away. Um, and it will give them a, some opportunity to feel the power of food at work in their own life. So I think it, you know, depending where your entry point is, I just really want to be mindful of that. We're all, as Oprah said, like we all have a stage, we all have a stage of opportunity that we can contribute from. So find your stage and your entry points, whether it is supporting community food or community food access. There's a lot right now around indigenous foods, social cultural foods. Um, there's so much wisdom, nutritional health wisdom to traditional food ways that have been eroded from this homogenized Western diet. How do we invite people into those food pathways that give them health resilience and a, a sense of connection to their community? So there's some really interesting work with grandmothers teaching the, you know, the children cooking because the grandparents have all this extra time and they have this knowledge of their community foods and regions. So no matter where you are, there's so much talk about like global and how do we all move towards the global sustainable development goals. But food happens on the ground person to person and that's the magic of it. So finding those entry points. But you also have, have moved with your business where, where you're helping to educate uh, or work with some of the companies as well. Do I understand it correctly? Some of the, some of the people who are helping to, to create the direction for, for all of us, because obviously it is a personal choice, but then there are forces that are bigger than all of us that are at work as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, as, as I've evolved and as my career has progressed, I've been really fortunate with opportunities to um, kind of continue swimming upstream. One thing I am personally passionate about is there is an elegant urgency to this moment that we are in because we are truly the generation, Chris, you and I, and anyone listening to this or watching this, we are truly the first generation to have full understanding of what is at stake and what is happening to the planet and to our health and to each other as communities. And we have this finite window. We are perhaps the last generation, if not us, then who will do it? Because we are the last generation, if you are to believe the IPCC report, we've got about eight years left before we go past some of these critical tipping points of the operating system of planet Earth. So there's some really interesting work around planetary health that Lancet has done and this idea of just as humans have systems, right? We have a cardiovascular system and a neuroendocrine system and a digestive system. The planet has these, these operating systems from freshwater and biodiversity and carbon and that we are rapidly moving past the safe, what is known as the safe operating space in many of these systems. So for me personally, my intention is to, what is the fastest way to make 
the biggest changes, the most positive changes possible. And that's moving up to working with companies and capital that are making investments to drive positive change and accelerate this transformation. It's been interesting to see some of the best practices, like having watched like Kiss the Ground or Biggest Little Farm and see, see the transformation. In some ways, it feels like it's something that, that gives us hope that, okay, we might, have, we might have run so far in this direction that we've stripped everything. But, it, and it comes back, it comes back to your theology in a lot of ways. It, it, it is sort of the essential, right? And building from the ground up and the coexistence and how, how plants and animals and everything are, are working together to create a system. How do we, how, how do we find a way to, to spread to spread that message and to make it to make it personal for all of us, because most of, for most of us, food is something we go to the supermarket, or if you're talking about in a food desert, that you go to the convenience store to get. I mean, we're we're removed from the personal part of it. We're removed from from dirty fingers and those kinds of things. How do we make it personal to affect that kind of change as well? That's a good question. So there's two things that I would love to bring up to this point. The first is, I actually think this notion that cheap food is where we need to be is a total myth. Um, and the reason I think that is, it's a race to the bottom of quality, and that's why it's driving chronic disease, especially in our most vulnerable populations. So we've, re we've managed to bring the price down of food dramatically, but the quality is not there and food waste has skyrocketed. So there's this, I'd love to see where food has more value and we're not tossing so much food. My grandmother's 102 and um, you know, hearing her story is of how she has related to resources. We, it's just totally different. And my kids, I'm just as bad, right? I'm not sitting on any pedestal or glass house. My kids, I, we st I still struggle with that um, food waste. But I because think- Because that's a huge part of the environmental. I, I hadn't realized- It's environmental, because you're using all those resources to create the food, and then you're just tossing it. And if you're sticking it in a landfill, it's generating methane. So unless you're composting it, it's actually a double whammy because you're not regenerating those, the carbon um, and the nutrients. You are kind of just emitting methane, which is a warming gas. And a lot of communities are not set up for composting or biodegradable uh, materials and things like that. So you think you're doing something that's right. good, but right. it actually ends up in the same place that everything else does. Right. So one thing, anyone listening, is if you can purchase food from brands and companies or producers, maybe you can't afford to do that. Like I have a garden and a compost pile, but I didn't for years and years. But what I could do is purchase from brands, purchase from companies, purchase from grocery stores who are living your values and aligning with those through third party certifications and verifications. And it doesn't have to be all at once. Start with like two new products a week that you're going to swap out or look at your everyday products and kids. That's a big thing. Like, Oh, if I don't have a real budget for organic, what's the number one thing I should swap. And I would say swap the thing that your child eats most every day. So for most kids, it's potatoes. So start with organic potatoes, then you'll minimize relative exposure. So just again, just take that mindset of what's one shift I could make. Um, and then, gosh, I said I had two things and now I can't remember what the second uh, thing was. Two things, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and I've interrupted you along the way and now I've, now I've totally forgotten where you were going yeah. with that. Yeah. But, but I think, I mean, I guess in some of this, this is, this is the nature of being personal, right? Is, is, the, is how, how to make it personal, how to make it, how to make it easy because it's really easy to feel stupid in these things. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to say, oh, well, I don't know how to create a garden. I don't know how. My first foray, I'll share with you, my, my first foray, and, and I'm looking forward the, in the new house to, to actually expanding this. So I'm trying to see what I can do. But I am 
growing my own uh, herbs and spices. So, so cilantro and basil and mint and, and some, uh, some peppers and some shishito peppers. And you know where this came from? This actually my wife, Jean, whom you know, bought me this for my birthday and she got it at the, at the hardware store here in Garden City, Utah. So she, she got these little starter kits, like these just- Oh yeah, ones. great. And you go and you water these cans and I've been using the, I've been using the cilantro. I have also, I didn't do a very good job on the first cilantro. I didn't realize that, because I've had to go back and figure out how to actually grow these things. So it started growing and I thought, okay, well we have fresh cilantro here. Let, let's throw it in something, let's make it work. So I basically took pretty much all of it mm -hmm. in there. Didn't realize that I was supposed to, that I was supposed to do it prior to the point where I did it. That I was supposed to do it when it was about like three inches high as opposed to like seven inches high. And that I also was supposed to go and water it afterwards. So what happened is my cilantro bolted, which means that it basically, like it dies and the seeds come out, which I had no idea that those seeds are coriander seeds. Mm -hmm. that, that That's was, amazing, look at what you've learned, likewise. If you're starting, like just go in humbly and learn. It's been such an evolution for us too, as we've done more gardening and composting. And this year I brought two rescue horses on for nutrients, right? For manure. Boy, has that been a learning experience. I mean, there is not a day I am not eating humble pie, just learning. And that's having a playful, creative, like it doesn't have to be all at once. Get started, get your hands dirty, see what's available locally, like Jean did. Um, but I also realized the second thing I wanted to say, and I do think it's a, a, a valuable point. It can feel really overwhelming with, if you watch the news about what some of these challenges are and what some of these things we need to solve are and how we really need to evolve consciousness almost um, and, and step into different mindsets collectively um, and individually. But I think the power of story story is such a way people connect um, because then it's not lecturing it's not me telling you something right why how can you create powerful story and we're seeing it on totally other veins with this like renaissance of storytelling that's happening in digital media i think there's such an opportunity we've got tremendous challenges ahead but we have such human spirit and innovation happening around the world. How can we leverage story? And nature is amazing. And that's, you mentioned Biggest Little Farm. That's such a great example of how people entered into topics through the power of story of nature, of nature's magnificence. And I was just doing an interview last week with a biodynamic vintner in Oregon, and he's been doing biodynamic farming for like 30 years and if, if you're unfamiliar with biodynamic it's like organic on steroids it's even more like a whole closed system of the farm the farm is the living organism and he was talking about the science that actually underneath when you begin to farm this way underneath in the soil all of the 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 plants all of the grapes are connected and they actually will share resources, nutrients, water um, through that fungal, almost like a web that's underneath to keep the organism thriving. And this is a real key in resilience when we look at fires in California um, and who, what, what is sort of staying intact. So, I think there's, I share that as an example of a story I was so drawn into. Like, I want to see that five minute story about how the, the, the um, vineyard is a living organism together. And isn't that a great metaphor for us as humanity, right? As human and as, as people. And it also, it sounds like from what we're talking about that it's a, they can be big choices that we have to make, and it can be expensive. I mean, it sounds like it can be expensive, but but a lot of this stuff can go in exactly the opposite direction. I mean, we talk about like 
like growing sprouts at your house, which, which you can grow relatively easily. I haven't done it yet, so I can't tell you for sure that that, but, but based on some of the research that I've done and some of the things that I've read and listened to, but it's, but it's nutrient dense mm -hmm. and something that's relatively inexpensive mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, even, even looking at COVID right now, I mean, looking at COVID, we don't really know where our lives might go and how we might have to be far more self-reliant than we'd ever planned. And looking at some of these simple things that we can do around the house, that maybe, maybe it is a garden. I'm not sure about the garden for me. I mean, I still have, I still have somebody mowing my lawn, you know? So it's like, so it's like. Hey, I just got to the garden two years ago, if that's any indicator, right? Like I, I really respect that. Um, and you're right. Cost. One of the beauties is, um, plant-based back to blue zones briefly and like what are some real specific steps people can take um, the number one thing you can start doing is adding more plants adding more minimally processed whole food plant-based foods to your diet um, and removing just having less it's not saying you have to be vegan you don't have to be vegetarian but smaller amounts of animal products, almost like that accent, high quality animal products, smaller amounts. The Mediterranean diet is a great model for something like that, but the Okinawan diet is another cultural pathway that does that. Um, in the in um, Hispanic communities, beans and rice with vegetables, uh, a very nice entry point. I mean, a lot of I remember in our school lunch program in Park City, instead of iceberg lettuce and ranch dressing, which is what I grew up with as a Tang kid and is in a lot and of US lunches, yeah. Yeah. they were doing because our elementary school was 60, over 60% 60 Hispanic. The salad was shredded cabbage with fresh lime. So finding easy entry points that you're excited about that match your cultural preferences and what you can find but plants pound for pound meat and animal products will be the priciest items in your grocery cart so that's one tip um, starting with cutting out liquid beverages well liquid beverages that's repetitive but cal caloric beverages even healthy ones like a coconut water or a birch water or a kombucha tea i mean that's that shit's expensive <laughs> If to start, if you're on a budget, just focus on the food and don't focus on any liquids because that can really eat up a food budget. Drink water. How about water, you tea, you know, but again, if people are asking, how do I do it on a budget? Focus on the food first, not all the liquid stuff that we're seeing, like turmeric shots and whatnot. Use turmeric in your cooking. You're going to have the same benefits. How about places, because you talked to about a more green diet, more vegetables in your diet. And for a lot of people, vegetables are either a side dish or they are non-existent. I mean, I know a lot of people, vegetables don't even exist in their diet. So this is a fundamental shift. How do you, can you recommend any, yeah. any recipes or things like that or places that people can go to be able to create a green meal as opposed to creating a meat-based meal, which is what most of us have grown up on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so Clean Eating Magazine, um, where I have a column, if you just go on their website, they, and the reason I love that is all of the choice architecture is baked in to be healthy and sustainable. So anything that you would find there would sort of fit that opportunity. We created a a program called the Go Clean 45. It was a 45 day health and happiness challenge by myself and then a PhD happiness expert. And um, there's, there's so many resources at Clean Eating Magazine uh, online. And then Mind Body Green is another press outlet that has really nice recipes for bringing some of this stuff to life in a way that feels relevant to you. Um, and Eat Well Exchange, to be honest, these two women I was telling you about, they had some stunning ideas and tips for getting started for families. Um, we can put these in the show notes, Chris, if that's helpful. Yeah. And these are all things that are available online. Online for free. Yeah. So this is, this is back to your, your days at, in Sun Valley when you were in the back of the bookstore 
trying to trying to find recipes, right? This is this is an easier way for people to go and find recipes because that is that is part of it, right? Is is you have to find a new recipe and you have to create a new repertoire of like, oh well, Tuesday night is you know Tuesday night's rice and beans or whatever, and we can celebrate it. And I like from a Blue Zones kitchen, I do. I do the chilero sauce as well. So the so with with the vinegar and the and the cauliflower and the peppers and the onions and this is this is where I'm learning stuff too, right? Like oh, parboiling. Okay, let me uh, let me look up and see what parboiling is, and then let me get on a YouTube and figure out exactly what it's supposed to look like afterwards and when I think it's done. And, and but but it's it's part of you know learning is learning is a great thing. Mm-hmm when we feel like we're actually learning something, when we don't feel like we're overwhelmed, when we feel like we're overwhelmed, then it's like, okay, I'm just going to stop. I can't move forward. So those are, those are great recommendations for places that people can go. We can put that in the show notes. And how about you? Just, we'll, we'll get you out on this one. What, what are you looking forward to? I mean, it's a part of, we're in a weird time, right? We're in this weird time of COVID where, we, where it almost feels like we can't, look forward because it's so overwhelming what's right in front of us but i know you as as an optimist what are what are you looking forward to and can you bring us along on your journey (laughs) oh that's really sweet chris um we're in a huge transformation period right now on the planet I think COVID is one of many things and it's actually an incredibly powerful time to be alive. And I think in the immediacy, what I am really um, intentional about is staying high at at a vibrational level. And remember, even just staying neutral right now, it would be amazing if nothing more if there's such a if you if you start to look at consciousness and sort of where where matter and energy meet um deepak chopra has done a lot of this work and and i'm speaking more from the heart now not from my science background but since you asked in such an open hearted way there energetically fear is the weakest place for humans to operate from When we operate from fear, our biology changes, our physiology, we shut down. um, And there's such a hive mentality that can drive, it can bring your energy down from the hive if you let it. And by that, I mean, if you're tuned into mainstream media 24 seven right now, you are going to feel stressed. You are going to be freaking out. You are going to, because that's what they're trying to do. And I only say that because, they want to they they want to keep you watching and i say this you know i've worked in media forever it was always about turning up the sensationalism so i'm not saying there's a some evil plan behind it but i am saying detoxing from media and information overload right now is actually a huge step that many people can take and that i personally i've taken for months i've been focused on keeping my own immune system primed and engaging as i need to with what's going on in the world but not the first few weeks like everyone you know i was constantly tied and it wasn't serving me so that's one thing i think to have a clear um energy and keep your immune system revved up so that should you get exposed to covid at least you will be optimized to be in that 99.9% of people who can sail through it and be fine. Um, And what I'm doing in the longer term is, you know, I really think the irony of having all this connectivity, right? We're connected to our phones, we're our smart speakers, like everything is connected. And I have two teenagers, so we're like, you know, in the as hyper connected, I'm learning every day. And I'm sure my kids are like 10 steps ahead of me. But the power of human connection now has never been more important, really. Like the power of connecting with people, both people you care about, but just people in your community who might need 
need you, who might benefit from having someone with a calm energy show up and see them for who they are. Um, I think people, when they lash out with anger, it's because they're feeling some kind of pain. That's what I see, um, is, is that anger is how pain and fear show up in public. And, and fear is one of those ones that's really hard, right? Because it's like, well, don't be afraid. You're like, okay, now you've made me more afraid mm -hmm. because you've told me not to be afraid. And your step about, about not engaging and indulging in the news because it is more sensational. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, you know, we, we want to be proactive and we want to be, we want to be practical and, 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 and we want to make good decisions as well, right? About our health, about the health of the people around us and, mm -hmm. and about our future. But we also, from the greatest adversity comes the greatest opportunities too. And there will be people who will be phenomenally successful coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. It's easy to feel like a victim of your circumstance. Are there any, are there any things that you've been reading during, during this time that you feel have, have filled your soul? Uh, you know, and fed your soul. I mean, we're, we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about the environment should be feeding your soul, things that are, have been feeding your soul or things that you can look at from, from your history that you say, this is, this is something that I go back to. I mean, being a theology major in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. it's like you're going back to the foundational stuff. This is, these are the stories that remind me of who I am and who I want to be. Do you, have, do you have anything that you might be able to recommend on your way up? <laughs> Well, I'm woo woo. I'm out there. I'm a theology major, so let me just buffer it with that. Um, David Hawkins, H A W K I N S, he was an MD who moved into the spiritual realm. Um, he was started as a psychiatrist, and it's um, power versus force and okay. yep. the map of consciousness and these different. Vi truly vibrational states that we all and we can all experience them at different times right but how um power and i know um what power means in the mainstream is different of how david hawkins he means when we use force and pressure to get something um, that's a lower vibrational energy than operating from a place of true power. And if you are operating and staying in this vibrational frequency, um, not only can you attract the outcomes that you want, but you attract people to you of similar frequency, right? Um, and so, and the, the difference, he would say, like, look at Gandhi taking down the British Empire or Ma Martin Luther King, these, these individuals who are extreme examples of operating from this place of power against systems that ultimately collapsed. So in this time of real transformation that we're in, Power Versus Force has been a book that I've gone back to a couple times just around, um, how you show up in the world, as Oprah likes to say, and I say this as a working parent who sometimes doesn't show up my best for my family. One of the things Pete and I talk about is like, you are responsible for the energy that you show up with in a situation. And so that's something I've been trying to think about in this moment when there's so many people so stressed and fearful and legitimately with a lot of struggles. I'm very privileged that because I can work from home and I have a partner, you know, how can I show up and just be a helper right now? I think that's great. I think that's great. And, and really, if there's anything that's come out of this talk, it really is coming from that, that fundamental place of essence, you know, that simple, you know, it's so easy to make life so, so complicated, mm -hmm. but it's coming from that simple, essential, elemental part of life. And, and hopefully, that can be a message that that helps a lot of people because because it's a challenge it's a challenge i mean it's it's much easier to achieve the complex than it is to achieve the simple and so it's a it's goal hard because it's a letting go you this is only going to get you so far you have to move here especially in times of chaos 
to find your life force and your center and your truth and your potential, which we all are drops of magical potential. <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality, every single one of us. And sometimes it's not even a choice, right? Sometimes it's, it's we are forced into that situation where we find our greatest sense of power, our greatest sense of, of strength. And so, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. It's been absolutely just a pleasure to catch up with you, really, but to learn about what you're doing and how important and, and, and how you're, you're educating so many people. And thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great. And we look forward to the honor, next. Sir Waddell, it is always an honor and a pleasure. And I love what you are bringing into the world. It's so important right now. And you're just the man to bring the message. It's just extraordinary to watch. I'm really happy and proud and just proud to watch you and so happy for you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and continue doing what you're doing. And we will look forward to seeing you all the next time.